Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Psalm chapter 1. And uh, we are uh, going through a series called A Better Life. And uh, as we think of a better life, um, you know, I mentioned something last week that we all look for a better life. And, and that's an okay thing. I, I have no problems with that, no qualms with that. As a matter of fact, I encourage a better life. I encourage that. People come to our addiction program. They come to our, our reading programs. They come to church. They come to Sunday school. I encourage prayer. I encourage Bible reading. I encourage Bible memory. I encourage a better life. And that's, an, that's a really, really great thing. And uh, as we think of a better life in the context of uh, Psalm chapter 1, we, uh, we come up with part 1 as we talked last week, a verse 1, which was, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And I mentioned last week that a better life has something to do with a departing man, someone who is departing from something. And in the context of, of Psalm 1-1, this departing man departs primarily from walking in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the advice. They depart from bad advice. Uh, secondly, not only do they depart from bad advice, they depart from a bad attitude, which is standing in the way of sinners. So we have, first of all, this departing person who departs from the people who lead the person to have a bad attitude, which leads to bad actions, right? So this is really crucial. And uh, as we think of someone who is looking for a better life, we say that this guy, this woman that's looking for a better life has something to do. And the things that they have to do is dealing with a departure, is dealing with a departure. I mentioned that if you get bad advice, it'll lead you to a bad place. So we start with getting good advice from good advisors. Very, very important. Then we have the right attitude. When we get good advice from good advisors, we have a right attitude, which leads us to the right actions. Uh, this is not just suggestive. This is a command, by the way. This is what God wants us to do. Start by getting good advice. Good advice. Now, as we talk about this morning in verse 2 of Psalms, Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, uh, last week we looked at a departing man. Now we're looking at a disciplined man. We're looking at a disciplined man. And can I say this by way of introduction, that a better life requires change? That a better life requires change. And if a person becomes change averse, where they're afraid of something changing, and we all know people like that, right? Where they don't want something new because they don't like change. They will never get better because they will always stay where they're at. So we have to be very, very careful of this. A better life requires change. But it also requires a level of discipline. A better life requires a life of discipline. Now, if you have discipline in all the wrong places, you'll never have a better life. There are a lot of people that think that, well, I can be disciplined in this and I can be disciplined in that, but you know what? They still don't have a better life, so to speak, uh, because they're not disciplined in all of the right areas. And by way of encouragement, let me encourage you this way, that one area of discipline promotes and provokes a discipline in another area. That is to say this, that if a person is disciplined with the idea of eating right, now I'm not saying just the person eats right kind of uh, naturally, just like, hey, I, I, I just have, I'm not exposed to bad food. But I'm saying if a person says, I am disciplined in the area of eating right, and I will not eat wrong, generally speaking, that discipline will promote an area of discipline in another area. For instance, the person who eats right generally is a person who exercises right, and vice versa. If you're exercising right, because that is an area of discipline in your life, I am going to be disciplined in this area of exercising. Generally speaking, you're going to eat right. How many of you go to the gym? I'm not asking, this is a rhetorical question, but how many of you go to the gym, get on a treadmill, burn 1,000 calories? By the way, that would take you hours if you've ever been on a treadmill and you see your little calorie count. It would take you a long time. But say you burn 1,000 calories and then go indulge in a cake. Generally speaking, that's not happening. So one area of discipline will promote and provoke another area of discipline. This is true across the board. 
So when it comes to a disciplined individual, be disciplined in one thing. I encourage people, be disciplined in the act of getting up early. Now, some people say, well, I wake up early just kind of normally. But that's not an area of discipline. That just happens normally. Just because you get up early doesn't mean you're a disciplined person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nod your head yes. Nod your head with me yes. Some people have to say, I am going to get up and I'm going to be disciplined even though I don't want to get up. That is a disciplined person, right? A disciplined person is doing what needs to be done even when you don't want to do it. It's saying, I'm going to do this because I know that I have to. It's better this way if I'm disciplined. So when we talk about Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, a disciplined man, there are two disciplines we find here, and we're going to look at those real quickly. First of all, he is a delighting man, a delighting man. Look at this verse with me. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord. A disciplined man, a one seeking a better life, is one who is a delighting man. Now, I will say this, there are two kinds of delight. There's the wrong delight and the right delight. And we don't want to delight ourselves in the wrong thing. Just like we can be disciplined in the wrong thing, we can also delight in the wrong thing. Wrong delight doesn't get you on the right path. Wrong delight doesn't get you on the right path. We have to have the right delight. In Proverbs 19, verse 10, not all delight is for everyone. Listen to this. This is great. Delight is not seemingly for a fool. Delight is not seemingly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over his princess. Now here's, here's the picture. A fool doesn't have delight and servants don't rule over princes. It's the other way around. See, wise people have a tremendous amount of delight when they're delighting in the right thing. But if you have delight in the wrong thing, you're a fool. Now listen. I think this could easily happen because a person is delighting in the wrong areas of their life. I, I find myself talking to people on a, on a day-to-day basis that say that there just is no hope, that they're, that they're out there seeking and they're not finding delight. And I have to ask myself the question, well, what is it that this person is delighting in? Are they delighting in their wealth? Are they delighting in their accomplishments? Are they delighting in... Their, their children and grandchildren. Now, I understand kids and grandkids are a wonderful thing, but is that where they're placing the emphasis of delight? And we have to be very careful not to put the emphasis of delight in the wrong area. We have to make sure it's done the right way and in the right, uh, on the right uh, object. So we get to Psalm 37, and we see trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also, here it is, ready, in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, notice the contrast between verses 3 and verse 4. Trusting the Lord and doing good is different than delighting in the Lord. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 4 says, delight thyself also in the Lord. Now, can I say this this morning? That a person can trust in the Lord and not delight in him. A person can trust in the Lord and not delight in him. No different than a person can be married and not be happily married. There is a difference. Now, when I say trust in the Lord, yes, for salvation, but also the furtherance of your spiritual walk. So, when, when we're saying trust in the Lord, it's not just for salvation, but it can be for provision. Trust in him and do good, but also delight thyself also in the Lord. We should have a delight in him. The result of trusting and doing good is having the land and being fed, and the result of delighting is God, listen to this in verse 4, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now some people think that verse 4 could mean that God is giving you what you desire, when I think that what God is doing is he's giving you the desire. There's a lot of people that say, well, you know, you know Joe, here's the deal. Uh, you, you trust in the Lord and do good. You, you delight yourself in him, and anything you want is yours. God will just give it to you. It's kind of somewhat prosperity gospel, isn't it? But see, I think it's different. I think it's different. I think what God is doing is he's actually placing in you certain 
desires, certain desires. One commentator says this, one who delights in him will have righteous desires. One who delights in him will have righteous desires. Psalm 21.2 speaks to this, where it says, thou hast given him his heart's desire. Not necessarily all of the things you want, but the things that you want is what he gives you. Does that make sense? This is crucial in discerning this. If a person is delighted in the Lord, then the Lord places righteous desires in that person. Let me give you an example of this. I don't know how many of you have heard some real soul-stirring preaching, a communicator, a speaker gets up and just lays it on, and you're just you're moved by God's Spirit. And you say to yourself, wow, I am just feeling compelled. Maybe it's on generosity. Maybe what God is doing is he's moving on your heart, and, and, and the, the message is on, is on giving. And, uh, and, and you just are, are thinking to yourself, man, I, just, I, I am not right with my giving. I just need to give more. Or maybe it's on marriage. Maybe the pastor or the communicator or the speaker gets up and says, you know, you could have a better marriage. Things could be better for you. And, and shows you maybe the contrast between a, a bad marriage and a, and a good marriage, a, a wrong marriage and a right marriage. What a godly marriage looks like, and you stand back and you say, I'm just, I need that. I want to I wanna have that. Or Bible memory. A pastor gets up or a speaker gets up and they, 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 they uh, kind of provoke you to Bible memory. And you say, man, I just need to learn God's word. And you go out and you're just excited. Well, whether or not it's Bible memory, whether or not it's a better marriage, or whether or not it's on giving, that desire that's in you to do right, guess who that came from? It came from God. God has placed in you that desire. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he will put righteous desires in you. And those desires are good desires. And by the way, that's God's will for your life. That's God's will for your life. Those desires that he places in you, if we ask anything according to his will, the Bible says he heareth us. When we say, hey, Lord, I just want to be a better husband, and I want to memorize your Bible better, and I want to be more generous, and I want to be more loving, and I want to be this, and, and all of these things are, are conducive to, to, to God's collective will in the Bible, it's God's will for your life. When you pray, when, when, when the message is on thankfulness, and you go out and you're like, i got to be more thankful, that's God's will for your life. It says it in the Bible. That this is God's will for your life. That giving thanks is God's will for your life. So these are really good things. He places in you these desires. A disciplined man is a, a man who has these right desires. Now I will say this. Not only is the path to a better life paved with a, a, a disciplined delighter, but it's also a deliberate delighter. It's a deliberate delighter. It's someone who delights with intentionality. It's someone who says, I want to delight in the right things. I want to be a delighter who is delighting in, 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 a, in a proper thing, not delighting in something that I do, accomplishments or, or something, but a disciplined delighter ought to be a deliberate delighter. This person is delighting in the law of the Lord. It says that in verse 2. Well, you go back to Psalm 1, verse 2. His delight is what? In the law of the of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, why would a person want to be a delighter in the law? Why would he have to be deliberate in delighting in the law of the Lord? You say, but we're not under the law anymore, Joe. I say, right, we're not under the law, but that doesn't mean that we forsake all of the law. As a matter of fact, delighting in the law of the Lord, in the commands the precepts, the statutes of God brings, thing back, brings things back to our remembrance. Look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. So, so beware of this. We want to delight. We want to bring these things to our remembrance. Why? He says, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks be mul multiplied, and thy silver and gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, beware, don't forget about the law of the Lord. Or else, when after you prosper, it says in verse 14, then thine heart be lifted up, 
and forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. See, here's the picture, is what's happening here. Guys, here's what's happening. Is when we forget the law of the Lord, when after we prosper, then our heart is lifted up and we forget about God. Our delight should be in the law of the Lord. We shouldn't forget about things like his commandments, his stats, judgments, and his statutes. A deliberate delighter is where you want to be in your life. Deliberately delighting. And if you're not a deliberate delighter, you'll be a, you'll be a fatal forgetter. You have to be deliberate in your delighting. Delight in the Lord. Without the law, there is lawlessness. There is lawlessness. And I hope we can all say that we just love the law. I love driving down the road and having the person next to me stay in their lane. I love, uh, I love coming to a stoplight. I had to run a stoplight the other day intentionally. <laughs> I actually did. And I was just following the crowd. Everybody else was doing it. But that, is this not true? We pulled up to the stoplight and uh, we were waiting and we were waiting and we were waiting. God was working on my patience. You know how this is, right? And you're sitting there and, and you realize that they keep getting the greens and we are stuck on a red. So I'm like, all right, well, eventually we're going to, you know, and finally... You know, a car turns and the car kind of eases through and drives across. And, and you're like, okay, well, maybe it's okay if I do it, you know. And so the next car does it. And then two cars in front of me was a sheriff. <laughs> so I was a little concerned, you know. I'm just thinking, you know what? He's going to hang a right. He goes down and hangs a right. You know, he's sitting over here with his just r- way to pull people over. And uh, so here it is. I, I deliberately had to run a red light. That has no bearing on the message. I am just <laughs> feel like it eases my conscience to tell you this. I, I don't know. I love the law. I love the fact that everybody stops when they come to a red and they don't just blow through it, right? So uh, we need to be a deliberate delighter. But not only are we to delight in the law of the Lord, but we're also to be a meditator. We're also to meditate. Now, a person can be disciplined in the wrong areas. A person can be delighting in the wrong areas. And I think a person can be meditating in the wrong areas. And what we need to do is we need to be meditating in the right areas. Psalm 1 verse 2 says, And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So not only are we to be a deliberate delighter, but we're supposed to be a meaningful meditator. We need to make sure that we are meditating on the right things. The right things. We have to be careful of this. A better life requires meaningful meditation. Uh, Anybody that worries about a, a specific uh, subject or, 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 or uh, has, has, can't just keep, get this thought out of my mind, you know, I keep, you know, are fretting about it, are technically, they're pretty good at meditating. However, that's not the biblical meditation that I'm talking about. But somebody who is fixated on one subject and just can't shake it, that person has a propensity to meditate. They're meditating in the wrong areas, but they're, in a sense, meditating. Now, proper meditation is not fretting about the wrong things, but focusing on the right things. It's focusing on the right things. Therefore, a better life, not not, uh, or a better life is not uh, acquired by just a deliberate delighter, but a meaningful meditator. Now, let me talk real quickly about the uh, the the method of meditation. The method of meditation, as it says here in Psalm one two. Uh, First of all, I want to note the frequency, the frequency. Uh, This is to take place day and night. Your meditation of the law of the Lord should be day and night. It should be all the time, not just from time to time. Our meditation should be constant all the time. Joshua chapter 1 says this in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, listen to this, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The object here, the frequency, is all the time. It's day and night. It's throughout the whole thing. We see it again in Psalm 119. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So our meditation is not just Day and night, it's throughout the day, according to Psalm 119, 9 to 7, or 97. So, 
not only is there a frequency, but there is a focus. There is a focus that we need to have. And the focus the psalmist gives here are several things that we need to meditate on. Here it is in Psalm 119.48b, I will meditate in thy statutes. That's a good place to start our meditation, meditating in thy statutes. Uh, Psalm 119.78b, will meditate in thy precepts. Psalm 77.12, I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all thy doings. Now listen to this. This is great. Not only is this person, is the psalmist, meditating, that is thinking over and over and over again about thy statutes, thy precepts, and all the work, but it's also he's speaking of them all the time. Our meditation, what we think, should come out of our mouth. We shouldn't just think about it. We should talk about all of these things that God has done. So there is a focus and an intentionality even here when it comes to our meditation. Now, we need to think about the right things, and while the law is specific to a portion of Scripture, it also talks about all of Scripture. So the law here is uh, thinking about not just the precepts, the statutes, the commandments, these things, but it's also thinking about the whole of Scripture. This is where our focus ought to be. We need to be focusing on the whole of Scripture. And Paul gives a nice summary about what we ought to meditate or what we ought to think about in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, in conclusion, this is what he says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is what Paul is telling uh, the Philippians. He says, think about these things. Now, how often is it in our lives that we think about things that are of, uh, of no consequence at all? How many times in our life do we think of things that are just are not just, are not pure, are not lovely, are not of a good rapport, there is no virtue, and we just think about things that really don't make any sense or think of things that are, are not are not good. We have to be careful of that. So our mind should be meditating on things that are meaningful. We need to have meaningful meditations, okay? And this is a good place to start, Philippians 4.8. Now, let me give you just a quick application. I think I have this verse up here. Uh, Philip, uh, Psalm 104.34. Psalm 104.34 says this. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Can I say this about meditation? Enjoy your time with God. Meditation is not a punishment. Meditation should be a pleasure. Meditation should be something that we enjoy doing, thinking about the law of the Lord, thinking about the things that are, that are holy and just, and all of this stuff in Philippians 4. Right? We need to have this mind and enjoy it. Enjoy your time with the Lord. One of the things I enjoy most is when I can empty my mind of the world and fill it with his word. And that should be a time of great release. It should be a time of, of great pleasure. We're going to, in just a moment, take communion. And communion is when you remember, you meditate, you think about the things that God has done for us, primarily shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. That's the time during communion. And other times, by the way, this shouldn't be just at communion. Now, I know a lot of people who, who just think about these things during communion, but we should think about it all the time. That Jesus came to this earth, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later. This should be something we think about all the time. Not just during communion, but communion is a time where we set it aside and we can focus on it. This is a good time. This is not a punishment, it's a pleasure. And I think the reason why this person is a deliberate delighter and a meaningful meditator, I think of the reason why this person is a, a disciplined man, not just a departing man, but a disciplined one. I think of it because he loves the Lord thy God. And when you really begin to love someone, the discipline that you have will increase. 
You, you, you will begin to be a much more disciplined individual. My love for my wife brings me home at night. My love for my wife keeps me focused on, 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 on uh, not, just, not just loving the Lord, but, but, but pleasing her. And I think that that's a good thing. And the more that I love her, the more disciplined I become in our relationship. The more focused I become. And I think the more that you love the Lord, the more disciplined you will become in being a deliberate delighter and a meaningful meditator. These are really, really great things. I hope you can take some of these things home with you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I told you I was going to pull out Joel's wallet. Here it is. I did not promise him I wouldn't look through it. He's not in this room right now. He's in the lobby, so he doesn't know what's going on in here. Wow, look at this. Oh my goodness, look at all this money in here. I'm waiting for him to charge the door right now, but he's not. He knows I'm lying. There must not be any money in there. Anyway, so uh, I want to show you this. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I just want to share this with you. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us, hates our sin. In order to go to heaven, we have to have this sin paid for. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership, it's not church attendance, it's not raising a hand, giving money, it's not making a pledge or an oath, it's not coming forward. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to make the payment for our sin. There are some churches that say, well, if you turn over a new leaf and you live a good life, they say, if you're, if you're good, you'll go to heaven. Friends, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. You've got to be perfect, right? Going to heaven requires perfection. This sin has to be paid for either by you, which you can't make that payment for, or Jesus Christ has to come to the cross to die on the cross to make that payment of sin for us. And 2,000 years ago, that's what he did. And the Bible says it's not about turning over a new leaf or heading in a different direction or getting baptized or coming to church. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There'll be no braggers in heaven that say, I got to heaven because I did this. I got to heaven because I got baptized. I got to heaven because I, I, I went to church nine times out of ten, or, or 51 weeks a year, or I, I went 52 weeks a year, or I gave money, and I gave more money, and I did this, and I walked an aisle, and I prayed a prayer. It's for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. The Bible says it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth in God. His faith is counted for righteousness. Not his works, not his being good. His faith is counted for righteousness. The way that you trust Christ as your Savior is simply by believing that he died for you, believing that he was buried and rose again three days later. When you trust Christ as your Savior, He makes the payment for sin that you couldn't make. And He looks at you and me as sinless as His Son, Christ. Now, yes, we're going to sin. Absolutely. And will that sin get us out of heaven? No, it won't. Because the payment for your sin debt has been made. When Jesus died 2,000 years ago, all of your sins were in the future. All of them. Your sins yesterday, your sins today, your sins tomorrow. He forgave them all. When you placed your faith in Christ, He took your sins and made the total payment for them all. The greatest gift of all. You get eternal life and you can never, ever lose it. People say, well, what if you do something really bad? You do something really bad every day. Well, what if, what if I commit murder? Well, what if you committed assault and you didn't actually kill the guy? Is that one worse than the other? The Bible says, for whosoever keepeth the whole law and yet offend it in one point is guilty of all. So one sin is not more grievous than another sin on God's scale. On our scale, we say, well, that deserves 10 years and that deserves life in prison. Well, that deserves an execution. We look at sin that way, by the way. But God does not look at sin that way. He says, Whosoever keeps the whole law and offends at one point is guilty of law. We have eternal life. That's what God promises us. Simply by faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing else. 
So if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I ask that you trust Him. It's not by saying something to me, but it's by communicating to God, saying something simple like this, Lord, the best I know how, I believe that Jesus died for me. And I receive that free gift of eternal life today.